very remote, that are very rugged, that they're very barren. So they have no vegetation in, they walk and walk and walk and walk until they find a tip of a bone that's sticking out. And then they excavate that bone and that bone may be nothing or that bone may be a complete skeleton. It may be a complete skeleton of an animal that is known, a dinosaur like T-Rex, or it may be a complete skeleton of an animal that is unknown. And then they will name a new species as I'm sure you've read or heard uh, from many newspapers that, you know, there's this new species of dinosaur that's found in Africa or in China or even in California, right? So um, I understand that I also should be um, um, using a little bit of Spanish here and there. So I'm just going to say that que hemos estado hablando de descubrimientos y cómo los descubrimientos empiezan siempre con el trabajo de campo. Now, uh, field work is very challenging. Imagine that you're camping. Uh, the weather is very hot, usually because you're in deserts. You have no water, no running water. Um, you can't take showers. Some people would say, hey, that's perfect, you know. But usually people may want to clean up after. Uh, you can't not do that. You have to use talcum powder. You have to use all sorts of things to you know, clean up. Um, many times you don't have toilets. So it's, it's a difficult, challenging uh, thing. But paleontologists have been doing this for over 150 years. And they have filled museums with discoveries. And in case you wonder if there is still, after all these years, much to discover, uh, the answer is yes. There is plenty out there to discover. So, you know, in time, maybe if you become a paleontologist, you may be able to make some important discoveries as well. Now, what happens after the field? After the field, those bones are brought to a museum. So luego, ahora vamos a hablar de lo que pasa luego del trabajo de campo y de cómo esos huesos son llevados a un museo. When those bones arrive to um, a museum, they go to a laboratory that's, that's prepared for cleaning those bones. And by that, uh, we usually call preparing, la preparación de los huesos. And usually that entails all sorts of uh, manual tools. Sometimes they're little mini jackhammers. Sometimes they're just simply dental picks. They're just the same dental picks that... Uh, that um, a dentist would use when you go to the dentist uh, in your mouth and, uh, and remove the rock away from the bone. That is an extremely lengthy and, and tedious process that only highly specialized people who know to do this do. If you come to the museum, you could see part of that work in our dino lab on the second floor of the NHM, the Natural History Museum. So, you know, this is a process that, as I said, takes a lot of time. When it's finished, a bone will go into a collection. That means it, it, will, be, it will be cataloged and it will put in a collection. Sometimes, of course, it could be used for a mount, like the mounts that you see for display, the mounts that you see in our dinosaur hall, for example. But most of the time, it will be in a collection and it will be accessible for researchers to study. And at that point, we make new discoveries because many times estos descubrimientos no ocurren solamente en el campo, también ocurren en el museo. So these discoveries happen many times in museums when people go and look at a fossil and realize that, oh, this was not T-Rex. As a matter of fact, this is a new dinosaur that's related to T-Rex, but it's different in this way or in that way. So um, uh, in terms of, and how do we, how do we study those uh, fossils? We study by looking at their anatomy, their shape. We compare them with similar fossils across the globe. And then, you know, you may reach a, 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 a conclusion 
that that particular bone may belong to a new species. But a lot of the work that we do is not about naming species, it's about understanding the lives of these animals. And, and, and usually the, the more specimens, the more individuals, the more fossils you have of a given species, the better you could understand them. Take T-Rex, for example. You know, if you have, as we do right now, I don't know, maybe several dozens of T-Rex specimens of different degree of completeness that have been found, all of them, for the most part, coming from Wyoming, Montana, a little bit of Canada. That's the only kind of like region in the world where T-Rex is known. And you could look at, say, uh, animals that are juveniles or you know very young and animals that are adults and look at the differences between them. Understand how T-Rex grew. And you know, clearly just the same way that we are different um, between uh, the time when we were a baby and the time we we're uh, an adult, that happened exactly the same with T-Rex as well. So you could notice the differences. If you have enough samples, you could also maybe notice differences between sexes, between the genders of these animals. You could say, well, we noticed that the male has this feature and the female has that feature. Something that, as you know, well, is very common among living animals. Take birds, you know, many species of birds have what we call um, sexual dimorphism, which essentially is that the males look one way, they may have this kind of plumage or they may have, you know, um, long ornamental tails or uh, tail feathers, something like that. And the females look differently. So that's something that we could only examine if we have a good number of specimens for a given species, right? So we could also look into all sorts of other uh, biological traits uh, uh, if we have enough of a sample. Now, there are also um, modern techniques that are used to understand the lives of dinosaurs. One that has become very common is what we call CT scanning, CT scans. These are essentially um, you know, instruments that allow you to X-ray the inside of a bone and then do all sorts of studies uh, with that. And that's become a very common uh, tool in paleontology because it's not invasive. I don't need to cut a skull in half to see the inside of the skull and understand, for example, the structure of the brain. I could have a CT scan that then allows me with some computer software, allows me to render a virtual image of the brain and understand some of the uh, brain structures and functions of T-Rex, for example. Um, we also uh, do a lot of work um, using what we call uh, histological um, sections. These are paper thin sections of bone. Imagine you have a, 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 a limb bone and I'm gonna cut it in half, I'm gonna grind it, I'm gonna turn it into a, essentially a slide of bone that then I am going to be looking at the bone structure, the, the tissue of the bone that is preserved and that tells me a lot about how these animals grew, whether they were, you know, whether they grew throughout the entire life, which they actually did not, whether they, you know, grew for 20 years and then stopped, whether they had, for example, growth spurts, which actually they did. And they are just like human growth spurts. They kind of like happen around the teen years, you know, during, during, uh, when the animals were adolescent, right? Um, we do all sorts of other things. If we have big samples of animals, we do statistical analysis. That means like we could measure all these bones and look at differences between populations and things like that. We do chemical analysis with say, um, uh, some of the fossils that may preserve soft tissue and may be able to 
you know, from that soft tissue, understand all sorts of uh, things through chemical analysis. And of course, we rely heavily on what we call exceptional fossils. Most fossils are found, for, for most dinosaurs, all you have are bones, right? But exceptional fossils, so uh, fossiles excepcionales, uh, unicos, those are, those are fossils that preserve a lot of soft tissue, whether it's skin, whether it's, say, uh, feathers, or, uh, you know, maybe internal organs that may be preserved, all sorts of things that are usually not preserved in the fossil record. And those give you a new dimension of, you know, information, and it allows you to reconstruct the animals much more accurately when they were alive. Um, let me now uh, spend a few minutes, if I have, talking about my own research. As Rachel said, part of my research is focused on what we call the early evolution of birds, or you could actually call it the late evolution of dinosaurs because birds are living dinosaurs. And so birds evolve from animals like T-Rex or Velociraptor, they're just downsized uh, dinosaurs, feathered and capable of flying. So my work um, entails going, you know, again, I work around the world looking at many different specimens, doing field work, looking at specimens that are being found by other people, fossils that are being found by other people, and trying to understand how birds became birds and how they evolved from uh, dinosaurs, how they acquire some of their key um, uh, functions, like their ability to fly or their, you know, remarkable plumage or, you know, their uh, warm bloodedness or their beaks, all sorts of things that, uh, that I do um, as part of my research. Um, Rachel, I think we could uh, begin with the uh, Q&A portion, if that's okay. Absolutely. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, one more yeah. thing, one more thing. I have, you know, I can't do this without, not without showing you a little fossil. So here, uh, let me show you. Um, you guys hopefully can see there is, this is, just to give you a context, what you, what you have here is a, an egg. This is the outline of an egg that was laid by a long neck dinosaur some 80 million years ago, long time ago. And what you see here is the skull of the baby dinosaur. So it's just a, one of those remarkable fossils um, when you have it's in what we call an embryo, an, an embryon inside the, um, uh, and obviously unhatched, you know, inside the an egg. So just to show you something. That was awesome. We saw, I saw a lot of students in the chat saying how good, cool good, it was. To great. See that. Thank you so much for sharing. We have a ton of questions and I'm gonna jump right into them. Um, so we had, just kind of going back to your process of excavation, um, Chloe and Alexis were curious, where are dinosaur bones mostly found? That's a great question. Uh, most of them are found in deserts. And let me tell you why. Because as I, as I mentioned, the way you find dinosaurs, we don't have, uh, say, some kind of a remote sensing device that you could, you know, read the ground and say, oh, here's a, look, here's a, a skeleton of a dinosaur. That is really for the movies. What we do is we walk the ground, we walk, the ancient um, rocks, the rocks that were formed in rivers or in lakes and that they're now, those rivers and lakes don't exist anymore. And, you know, those rocks are in the surface. Here in California, you know, we see rocks all over the place because we live in a desert pretty much. And then, you know, it's easy to imagine that there's a bone that sticks out from this cliff or this, uh, you know, hill. And that, yeah, that could be a dinosaur. But if you go, say, to the East Coast, all that land is covered by soil and forest. And that's why 
you rarely hear from of dinosaur discoveries in New Jersey, say, you know, and most typically they are in Montana or Arizona or, you know, uh, Utah where there are deserts and badlands. That makes sense. And that kind of answers, I think, Theo's question about how do you know where to dig for dinosaurs? But could you elaborate a little bit on Yeah, kind of because, you know, element? that also depends a lot on your objective. You know, dinosaurs lived during a very long time from roughly 230 million years ago to about 66 million years ago when big dinosaurs became extinct and only the birds survived. Um, so, but some people say would, would like to uh, uh, learn more about Triassic dinosaurs or Jurassic dinosaurs or Cretaceous dinosaurs. And then you may be targeting different areas depending on the geologic information that you have. Great, that's a yeah, really great um, way to frame it and think about how the, the rock formations are telling us about the age of that we may be able to find dinosaurs exactly. um, from that time period. Thank you. Um, let's see. So Brenda was curious, how do you distinguish dinosaurs from other animals? Ah, that's, that's a really good question as well. It's all based on anatomy. Um, dinosaurs are defined by some specific anatomical features. Like for example, in their hip bones, they have a, an opening, a window, a hole, where the head of the femur fits in, and that's a dinosaur uh, characteristic. Their, their limbs, instead of say, the limbs of a, a crocodile or a lizard that are, you know, that are sprawled outside um, uh, the body like this, their limbs are positioned beneath the body, you know, and that's another um, dinosaur feature. So there, there are a number of, uh, um, anatomical uh, um, features of their skeletons that allow us to say, this is a dinosaur, this is not. But the bottom line is that sometimes it's tricky when you're very close to, you know, is it a dinosaur or is it something that is not, but yet is very close to it, it gets difficult. That makes sense. Um, and so we have a couple of specific questions about dinosaurs. Um, and I know it may vary depending on the type that you're referring to, but Chloe and Rachel, and we had a couple of other students curious about the lifespan of dinosaurs. How long did they generally live and what did that kind of look they, like? They, you know, you would imagine that they live like, uh, say, a turtle for a very long time, but actually that isn't the case. You know, the, the dinosaurs for which we know the, their age when they died, uh, obviously we know the, the ages when they died because we find them as fossils, right? So they're usually not much older than 30 or 40 years. So you could imagine, say, T-Rex probably had a lifespan of not much more than 30, 35 years. They grew extremely fast because this little guy that I showed you, you know, this, this animal that is in, the, in this egg, because this isn't an egg that is very big, it's roughly the size of an ostrich egg, the animal, the hatchling couldn't have been very big either, right? So it was probably a little, little um, dinosaur, maybe, you know, 15 inch long. But remember, this is a long neck. So it had a very long tail and a very long uh, neck. And uh, in, in the span of 20 years, it became a 70, 80, 100 uh, uh, foot long animal. So they grew, I mean, that's essentially the same amount of time that it takes us from go from, you know, being a baby size, a newborn baby to the an adult size. So they grew Pretty very neat. fast. Yeah. And it's neat that we have found evidence of kind of that, that growth pattern or how that works yeah. over time. Yeah, really fascinating. Uh, okay, lots of questions here. So I'm gonna try and get through a few more while we have our time left. Um, so we had a question about how do you know what type of dinosaur is what and kind of figure out the arrangement of bones that should be present on a skeleton? Yeah, again, that is a process of, you know, discovery and learning more and more. And, you know, uh, 
and there's still take a take a, a common dinosaur like stegosaurus we all know stegosaurus you had those plates along the back right but there's still a fair amount of discussion about how were those plates uh positioned were they parallel were they you know alternating plate for a long time there was a question of does it have one row now we know that it has it had two rows but you know those are not uh easy questions when uh your evidence is essentially a bunch of bones that are all loose in in a, in a river bed you, you, you don't have so there is a lot of anatomical work that goes uh into that and and also you know new evidence and new evidence and new evidence that tells us new things that's an important piece of that too that you know our, our ideas of maybe how skeletons were supposed to be arranged have changed over time absolutely. as well absolutely like t-rex you know decades ago um if you look at some of the old photographs you will see that t-rex had uh an arm with three fingers but of course now everybody knows that there were only two fingers right so in the hand of the t-rex i have a related question um and kind of two pieces of this nathan and hajun were curious um do fossils preserve any organic tissue like skin or organs and then miss barkas is curious if you happen to have any evidence of what coloring like what actually dinosaurs looked like with their skin on you know fossils preserve um organic soft tissue structures sometimes mostly they are uh, the fossils that uh, are found in in lake sediments sediments that are you know very gently deposited at the bottom of a lake and for some very specific uh, conditions you know those uh, tissues did not decompose and decay um whether you know you're going to recover the actual organic uh, matter of that is sometimes a little bit more questionable and you have to be very careful because often there is um essentially uh contamination right and it's hard to tell whether it is bacteria dna or you know or or the dinosaurs dna i mean you only get a little fraction and uh, but uh the other question was about i'm sorry um blanking out um about the coloring like oh, the color yes evidence. yes yes for those dinosaurs that are feathered you know because feathers have little um sacs uh with pigments that we call uh, melanosomes uh in those sacs sometimes are preserved so you could use very powerful microscopes to their microscopic structures right but you could see them and they're preserved in the plumage and you know the shape of these melanosomes is specific for certain types of pigments so you could uh you know uh, have a general idea whether the plumage was black or whether it was brown or maybe it was you know black in this area in maybe lighter in this area so but you know you could get a a, a general uh idea of of color very cool okay we have time for one more question and it's probably the hardest one so far um nancy was curious what is your favorite dinosaur <laughs> that's that that question always comes up right i would say t-rex is clearly you know one of my favorite dinosaurs but i like archaeopteryx which was one of the earliest bird as well so i like all dinosaurs we love dinosaurs we had a question from the um, in the chat someone asked do you love dinosaurs and i think we have probably proven that to be true really? this time they're together. cool they're cool animals they certainly are well thank you so much again dr kiape for your time and sharing with us all about the work you do at the museum we had so much fun today Thank you so much Rachel and thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
I'm going to go ahead and close us out of our program today. I want to thank all of our students and teachers for joining us today. Um, so if you want to see a little bit more from the museum, you can check us out on our Instagram at NHMLA. You can also see the recording of this program, among others, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash NHMLA. I also want to highlight an amazing program that's going to be happening this weekend. It's our pretty famous festival, Dino Fest, and we have um, an iteration of virtual programming that's happening on Saturday, September 25th. And then we have some in-person festival programming happening at the museum on Sunday, September 26th, which is, is free with museum admission. So we encourage you all to come visit us and nerd out about all the cool dinosaur things. We thank you all again for joining us and hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye everyone.